The birth of Jesus is an important celebration for Christian believers. The narrative we celebrate every year is familiar to us because of its depiction seen in everything from lawn ornaments to mantle displays to calendars. But the cohesive lawn display is actually depicting two stories, not one. I don't think many people, including Christians, know much about these two stories, so I thought I would take a moment to break them down, sharing what I know. Particularly problematic for me is the position of taking the Gospels literally and as without error, and hopefully this breakdown will shed some light on why such notions may be problematic. I think an important first step is to consider our sources. There are many accounts from the first and second century which have contributed to the lore, which we won't discuss. The most interesting one is the Proto-Gospel of James, which features a narration by Joseph as time stands still during the moment of birth, and a maiden's hand being burnt off after she examines Mary to see if she was really a virgin. That one's actually a fun read. The traditional Christian sources related to the birth are the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. These are two of our four canonical accounts concerning Jesus found in the New Testament. Luke and Matthew are called the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means seen together. Luke and Matthew not only tell similar stories within their Gospels, they share content verbatim, word for word, or verse for verse, or passage for passage. Why do we care? Because it means they utilize the same sources when building their accounts. Matthew and Luke quote the Gospel of Mark, or possibly a source which Mark also used, within their own Gospels quite heavily. 55% of Matthew and 42% of Luke is derivative of Mark. Matthew and Luke share another source which Mark does not contain. Scholars refer to this as the Q text. Q represents another 25% of Matthew and 23% of Luke. In total, this means that 80% of Matthew and 65% of Luke is derived word for word or verse for verse or passage for passage from these two sources. There are other portions shared between Luke and Mark, but not Matthew, or Matthew and Mark, but not Luke. The Gospels were assemblies of other accounts with only small percentages unique to any single source. And given how many first century accounts are lost, they likely shared these unique traditions with other long lost passages. The passages within the shared material generally contain the miracles, exorcisms, teachings, and Jesus' last days. The portions where they are unique are generally represented by the narrative of the empty tomb, the resurrection, and the birth narratives. It's worth noting that neither Mark nor Q contain a birth narrative, and given that our earliest and most complete manuscripts of Mark do not contain the resurrection, neither contain a resurrection narrative. So the question is, when they don't collaborate with similar sources, do they corroborate each other sufficiently to provide multiple attestations to events garnering support for being considered as historical? You should consider what type of witness testimony you would want in a trial, and the criteria by which you would consider those accounts. So let's go ahead and start with Luke chapter 2. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was the governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Now, at this point in history, Israel is divided into two kingdoms under Roman rule, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judea. Joseph and Mary are living in a town in Galilee, in the north called Nazareth. Jesus, throughout the rest of the Gospels, is known as a Nazarene. Within Matthew, Mark, and Luke, his ministry is run out of Capernaum, and he remains in the Galilean countryside until he goes to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom of Judea in his final days. Why is it important that Jesus is born in Bethlehem? Because that is where our prophecy states the Messiah will be born. Outside of the birth narratives, there is no mention of Jesus being born in Bethlehem. Now, in this passage, Caesar Augustus is taking a census of the inhabited earth, requiring everyone to return to their ancestral home. I see a few issues here which are, at the very least, worthy of scrutiny. A census of the inhabited earth seems unlikely, but we'll assume the author is writing in the first century and intends the Roman Empire. 
the Roman Empire was enormous at this point, and we actually have a lot of historical data on Roman censuses and practices surrounding them. Joseph returns to the home of his ancestor, David. King David represents his ancestor from a thousand years before. This too seems far-fetched. Was everyone in the empire to return to the home of their ancestors from a thousand years before? The practice in every Roman census we have on record was for the census takers to do the traveling, not the census participants. Can you imagine a census where everyone in the empire, or even just in Israel, were required to return to their ancestral home? It doesn't seem likely. The last issue is a historical one. We have good records for Quirinius's first census, and it occurred in 6 AD. We know this because Quirinius became the governor of Syria following the exile of Herod Archelaus, and a census was taken which spawned an uprising by Judas of Galilee. Josephus records the census as an accounting of the money and property following Archelaus's exile. So why is it why is a date of 6 AD problematic? In Matthew chapter 2, Jesus is born before the death of Herod the Great, whom we know died in 4 BC. Beyond Quirinius's specific census, there is no census anywhere near 4 BC in the Roman Empire. Further, Herod the Great's death is what put Herod Archelaus in power, and Herod Archelaus then has to be exiled for Quirinius to be put in power as the governor of Syria. I find this problematic in taking the account as historically accurate, but I feel there are other inconsistencies more accessible which will render this a moot point. Luke continues with Jesus being born in a manger with no room in the inn. Some shepherds have a revelation from an angel of the birth of the Messiah. They are told Jesus was born in the city of David and decide to head straight for Bethlehem. They arrive and tell Mary what had been said to them. She ponders it, they head back, and from this point we are given some handholds by which to establish a timeline. Luke continues in verse 21. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now the laws regarding childbirth are laid out clearly in Leviticus chapter 12, and fortunately they are very specific. They read, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the days of her menstruation she shall be unclean. On the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, and she shall remain in the blood of her purification for thirty-three days. And then it goes on to speak specifically to the sacrifice, stating, But if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Now in Luke, this would mean there are 40 days between Jesus' birth and the sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. Joseph sacrifices two doves, showing their lower stature. Luke continues with the account of the two conversations at the temple, one with an elder man, Simeon, and the other with a temple servant named Anna, and then concludes chapter 2 in verse 39. When they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city of Nazareth. To reiterate Luke's account, Joseph and Mary traveled to Bethlehem from Nazareth because of a census. Jesus is born there. There are 40 days until the ritual sacrifice. And then at that point, they returned to Galilee, quote, when they had performed everything according to the law, end quote. This timeline and the events laid out are important when comparing this account with the Matthaean account. Let's now take a look at the account in Matthew. 
Chapter 1 contains the genealogy of Jesus and a brief narration of Joseph having the virgin birth revealed to him in a dream and the actual birth of Jesus. There is no mention of location nor of travel. Matthew chapter 2 begins with, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. I want to stop there and make note of a few things. Nazareth is not mentioned and our story begins in Bethlehem. This will be something I'll want to touch on later, so just make a mental note. This verse also makes note of Herod the king. Herod the Great plays a significant role in this narrative. He is not to be confused with his sons, Herod Archelaus or Herod Antipas. Herod the Great is the client king over both the northern and southern kingdoms, and upon his death, they are divided by the Romans amongst his three sons, Philip being the third. The reason this is important is because Luke dates his narrative to the governorship and census of Quirinius, who is installed upon the exile of Herod's son, Herod Archelaus, in 6 AD. Herod the Great dies in 4 BC, a difference of 10 years. If Matthew says that Jesus' birth was in the days of King Herod and features him as a main character after the birth, and in Luke, the census of Quirinius, which we know from the histories of Josephus, is ongoing before Jesus' birth, then they both can't be right. This is far and away the dominant view among historians. Considering we are not historians, let's consider this claim of Luke being provisionally plausible while evaluating the rest of the text. I find it compelling, but I think we'll find it's a moot point. Matthew goes on to say, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Gathering all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Then they cite the prophecy, and Matthew continues, Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. Just because I think people blur them together, I I want to make a note that the Magi and Matthew are different from the shepherds in Luke. It's not a big deal, but I think people tend to conflate them. The Magi come asking where the king of the Jews has been born, saying they saw a star. In the portion of this story, uh, Herod and all of Jerusalem are troubled by these Magi coming to ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Magi from another country show up looking for a king of the Jews, and all of Jerusalem is concerned? Herod is concerned to a point where he gathers all of his priests and scribes to ask where? I think this story mirrors one of the themes found in Matthew's Gospel. The Gentile Magi from the east travel to Jerusalem to worship the king of the Jews, and the Jewish king Herod and all of Jerusalem are troubled by the news of a Messiah being born. I think this foreshadows the rejection of Jesus by the Jewish people and the adoption by the Gentile non-Jewish believers. The passage continues. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and the star, which they had seen in the east, went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they saw the child. In this passage, they were in the east and saw a star and headed west to Jerusalem. And upon hearing Herod, they went on their way, following the star to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is six miles from Jerusalem. Why would King Herod, gravely concerned about the birth of the king of the Jews, not take more action if it's to the south six miles to Bethlehem? Further, if all of Jerusalem is troubled by this, Where is the corresponding response? We will see that Herod is willing to take extreme action to prevent this. In regards to the star, I'm not looking to argue over miracles, but I have a few observations. Bethlehem is exactly due south of Jerusalem. If you are following a star in the west coming from the east, 
and happen upon Jerusalem, you would not be following the same star going from there to Bethlehem. Going from Jerusalem to Bethlehem is due south. As well, the star goes on before them until it comes and stands over a house where the child was born. One simply has to imagine what it would be like to walk towards a given star for six miles to see the problem in it leading someplace as specific as an inn. The passage continues with the Magi being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, an angel appearing telling Joseph to, to flee to Egypt, with Joseph leaving that very night, and Joseph remaining there until the death of Herod, which fulfilled the prophecy. Herod sees he has been tricked by the Magi and commands that all male children in the vicinity that are two years old and younger be slain, quote, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi, end quote. This, too, was to fulfill prophecy. The account finishes in verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Given what we have read in Luke concerning the 40 days for the circumcision and the rites of purification in Jerusalem, with a statement that when the rites were fulfilled, they returned to Nazareth, I find the flight to Egypt in Matthew not to fit the timeline for Luke, and as we shall see, the geographic depictions mirror this. Luke would have omitted a story not only with major implications and interest, but with prophetic value. There is no mention of Herod, of lives at being at risk, or of a flight to Egypt with death sentences to all children under the age of two. Despite having a thorough record of Herod's atrocities, there is no such record in any of the histories. Now, it is conservatively 100 miles to Egypt as the crow flies, involving both a newborn and a recovering mother. The family is then said to wait there until the death of Herod. That would constitute a trip of 200 to 300 miles by first century travel, with added time for the period to Herod's death. That would seem to prohibit inserting this flight before the purification of rites in Jerusalem in that 40-day window. That would mean that the family would have had to go after the rites of purification. But there are a few problems with this. In Luke's Gospel, it says, Once they fulfilled all the law required of them in Jerusalem at the temple, that they went back to Nazareth, and makes no mention of a major trip to Egypt, nor of a trip to Bethlehem, again, not having mentioned anything regarding a threat to their lives, nor a mention of Herod the Great. In Matthew, it says, the Magi were warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod in Jerusalem, and that when they had gone, the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him to take the child to Egypt, and that he did so while it was still night. They clearly didn't leave before the Magi. Are we to think the Magi left after being warned, and 40 days later Joseph was in Jerusalem, and then had the dream, and went to Egypt for some time under a th threat of death, despite neither author mentioning the travel or areas in question, and one author clearly saying they left for Nazareth after all the rites were fulfilled? This portion seems irreconcilable, even when affording the largest stretches, and along with the other issues, seems to be in line with these accounts just simply being different. Now, Herod, upon learning of the Magi not coming back just six miles away, orders the killing of males two years old and younger, quote, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi, end quote. For a birth happening six miles to the south and the Magi on the road following a star and reporting to Herod the first time it appeared, how does Herod figure anywhere near two years old and younger? Was this to suggest that for somewhere between one to two years, Herod was unaware the Magi would return from the city six miles to the south to report? Or would this suggest the Magi were on the road for some time before the birth for nearly two years? The account continues, But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, 
he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, he left for regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Here again we have Archelaus reigning after Herod's death in Matthew, while in Luke, the census of Quirinius, successor of Archelaus, has taken place. The last portion wraps up the account and goes toward one of my first points. The passage says that Joseph and Mary were to return to Bethlehem in the southern kingdom of Judea, but that because Herod the Great's son, Archelaus, was given control over that area, they chose to leave for Galilee and lived in a city called Nazareth. The author placed Joseph and Mary's residence as Bethlehem, and that once they are afraid for their lives, they chose to live in Nazareth of Galilee. This is in contrast to Luke, where they lived in, Ge- in Nazareth and go to Bethlehem due to a census, and then return to Nazareth after a trip to Jerusalem. In summary, outside of Joseph and Mary having a child named Jesus in Bethlehem and eventually residing in Nazareth, the two accounts are different in almost every respect. In Luke, you have a massive census under Quirinius, a trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, a birth in a manger with shepherds in attendance, a following of the law and a sacrifice in Jerusalem, and a return to Nazareth. In Matthew, you have a birth with no mention of an inner manger in Bethlehem, a visitation by Magi, a a death threat from the King Herod within the context of a massacre of children, a flight to Egypt and a waiting for the king to die, and a return avoiding life in Judea and heading to Nazareth. Given the synoptic nature of the Gospels, I think these are by far best explained as being two very different traditions which seek to place Jesus in Bethlehem at the time of his birth. I would encourage anyone to open their Bibles and compare the birth narratives side by side themselves. I find the harmonizations neuter each of the authors and that the text is richer when you're able to take it for what it is rather than imposing theological necessity on it. I appreciate you watching this, and hopefully you got something out of it. Thank you.